In this chemistry lesson, we're going to look at alkanes and alkenes. The first aim is to compare the structure and properties of alkanes and alkenes, then explain the process and purpose of cracking, and then finally explain the problems linked to making synthetic polymers, which you may think of as plastics. Let's start with another thought-provoking idea. This painting of lobsters is actually made from a substance that's made from the actual subject of the painting. What I mean by that is this is made from acrylic paint. Acrylic is a polymer, a synthetic polymer made from crude oil. Now if you remember, crude oil is made from the ancient fossilised remains of sea creatures such as lobsters. So it's not too dissimilar to the idea of a painting of yourself made from the ancient fossilised blood of ancestors from the past. But acrylic is just one synthetic polymer. There are so many more and they have so many uses. And until we find an alternative to synthetic polymers, we will have a high dependency on crude oil. And this is not a good thing. So if you remember, crude oil was a mixture of different hydrocarbon molecules. Alkanes and alkenes are examples of hydrocarbon molecules, but they are different. So let's find out the key differences. So here are some examples of alkanes and alkenes. One very easy way to tell them apart is the way the word sounds. So methane is an alkane, ethane is an alkane, propane is an alkane. Whereas alkenes, ethene is an alkene, propene is an alkene. In your exams, you will need to know how to draw all of these. Alkanes are very easy to draw because you just have your carbon backbone. So one carbon here, two carbons here, three carbons here, and each one is attached to a hydrogen atom. So if you remember before, I was drawing hydrocarbon molecules like this in the crude oil tutorial. But to understand alkanes and alkenes, I draw them like this with little sticks to represent the bonds. Drawing them like this helps you understand the difference in structure between alkanes and alkenes. So one thing to note here is to work out how you draw an alkane, just remember that you double the number of hydrogen atoms compared to carbon, and then you add two for the end. So you can see one carbon, double it, that's two hydrogens, then add two at the end, four hydrogens, that makes methane. Let's take ethane, two carbons, double it for four hydrogens, and add two at the end, and that gives you six in total. With propane, three carbons, double it for six hydrogens, and then two at the end, and that gives you um, propane. So relate that to these chemical formulae. Hydrogen is always double the carbon plus two. So one carbon doubled plus two, four hydrogen. Two carbons doubled plus two, six hydrogens. Three carbons doubled plus two, eight hydrogens. Alkenes are much simpler than that in terms of the formula, but more complex to draw. So you literally just double the number of hydrogens for every carbon. So two carbons here, four hydrogens here. Three carbons here, six hydrogens here. If I was to give you a tip, the only alkene they really focus on you being able to draw is propene because it's quite complicated, but I'll show you a little trick for that later. Now you may have noticed that all the carbon atoms and alkanes share single bonds with other atoms in the molecule. Whereas with alkenes, there's always the presence of this equal sign, which is actually a double bond. You see, carbon has the potential to bond with four things, but in alkenes, there's this spare bond, which hasn't bonded to anything individually. Instead, it's latched onto another carbon. This means alkenes have the potential to have other stuff added onto them because this spare bond can be released and it will bond to other things. Because in alkanes, all the single bonds are being used up, you cannot add anything on to an alkane. For this reason, we describe alkanes as saturated molecules. Think about it like if you've been outside in the rain for a long time and your coat is completely soaked, it cannot hold any more water, so the water just drains and drips off your coat. Your coat is saturated with water. So alkanes are saturated molecules. You can't cram anything else in there. By contrast, alkenes are unsaturated because of this double bond, this potential for it to unattach from the carbon and bond to other things. So just as a definition, saturated means all carbon atoms share single bonds with other atoms. Unsaturated means the molecule contains at least one carbon-carbon double bond, a double bond between the carbon atoms, never between the hydrogen atoms, just the carbon atoms. And finally, for reasons you won't understand yet, but you will in a second, 
Alkanes do not change the color of bromine water. This is a way we can test for alkanes and alkenes. So bromine is a browny, orangey color. Bromine water means it's been diluted with water and it will not change it. Whereas alkenes will decolorize bromine water. This is another chemical test. Like if you remember, you had to learn the test for hydrogen, oxygen, and chlorine. And it's very popular. It comes up a lot in exams. So remember this. So let me give you a quick masterclass explaining how to draw alkenes. Now I'm going to go for an even more complex alkene than you need to know, but as I've already drawn the other one, it doesn't really help if I draw it again. Now this alkene is given the chemical formula of C4H8. The first thing you do is draw the carbon backbone. So I've got four carbons, so I've written them down here. Each one is an individual carbon atom. Now draw the double bond between the first two carbon atoms and single bonds linking the others. This is just one way you can do it. You may see double bonds at the end, but if you follow this, it's absolutely fine. You can stick to this method. Now we have eight hydrogen atoms to place, but remember that carbon only has four bonds. So here's two being used by this carbon. This carbon's using three of its four bonds. This carbon's using two of its four bonds, and this carbon only one. So I would draw the remaining bonds now. So the first carbon, I can only draw two bonds because it's already used two in its double bond. The second carbon, I can only draw one bond because it's used three. The third carbon, I can draw two bonds to give it four. And the final carbon, I can draw three bonds to complete it. And now I just add the hydrogens. And there you have it. So remember, first draw the number of carbons. Then do the bonds, the double bond being the first bond between the first two carbons. Then complete the remainder of the bonds and then add the hydrogens afterwards. Don't let where you put this hydrogen, for example, panic you. You could put it above here. What's more important is you've got the right number of each type of atom, and they've got sharing the appropriate amount of bonds. Also, sometimes you might see the hydrogens displaced or put diagonally from this carbon. Again, it doesn't matter. It's the number and the bonds that matter. So now let's look at why alkenes decolorize bromine water. So here's my orangey browny bromine water. I've only drawn two atoms in here to make it simple to understand. Here's an alkane, here's an alkene because of its double bond. So if I put the alkane in here first, nothing happens. The color stays the same because alkanes are saturated. They cannot bond with the bromine. There's no spare bonds here. You can be tested on this. So be aware that alkanes bring about no color change. So let's take that one out. Now let's put the alkene in. So here we have that double bond. Now I didn't mention this before, but the double bond is not ideal. It's basically just a make do while you don't have anything more attractive to bond to. Now bromine's a very reactive chemical, so it's a very attractive opportunity for this carbon to unleash that bond and bond to the bromine. So what happens now is that bond snaps open and the bromine atoms will now be attracted and bond to these now spare bonds. When the alkene has bonded to bromine, the properties of that bromine water change and it becomes colorless. And I'll show you what that looks like for real later. So that's how we compare the structure and properties of alkanes and alkenes. So now let's look at the process of cracking, which essentially sounds like what it is. Cracking is a thermal decomposition reaction. That means when you break something down using heat, that breaks down long chain alkanes into smaller useful alkanes and alkenes, which are obviously very useful as well because of that spare bond. Cracking requires heat and a catalyst. A catalyst is anything you add to a reaction which speeds it up, but the catalyst itself will not be used up in the reaction. So long alkanes have a limited use. For example, they're stringy and gloopy like road tar. Now, obviously, that's useful, but limited. We can't use it for other stuff. This is why we have developed this technique of cracking, to make useful stuff out of stuff which has a limited use. You see, shorter alkanes are more useful. For example, a lot of short alkanes are fuels like petrol. And alkenes are very useful because we use them to make plastics. So all we do is apply heat and a catalyst to a long chain alkane and it starts to break or crack into smaller alkanes and alkenes. More sophisticated exam questions might ask you to complete a chemical equation. These may look scary, but they're really simple. You just need to remember the idea of conservation of mass. In other words, matter cannot be destroyed or created. So whatever's on this side must be found on this side as well. So on this side, we have 12 carbons and 26 hydrogen atoms. So we need to find the same amount on this side. Currently we have 
two molecules of ethene, so two times two carbons. So we have four carbons here and eight hydrogens on the other side, because remember, you're doubling C2H4, so you have to double the amounts of each atom. So now we just have to work out the difference between these values. So 12 carbon atoms take away 4 carbon atoms gives you 8 carbon atoms. And 26 hydrogen atoms take away 8 hydrogen atoms gives you 18 hydrogen atoms. So the missing molecule would be C8H18. You'll know it's right because if you add up the number of carbons on this side, they'll equal the carbons on this side and the same for the hydrogen. So cracking is one of the more sophisticated practicals you can do in a lab. It's a bit tricky to perform, and as such, it comes up in exams a lot, even for foundation. So I will show you some video footage on it, but just to make it clear, because there's a lot going on, I've done a diagram as well. So the setup is as follows. You've got your mineral wool here, which is soaked in an alkane fuel, such as paraffin. Then you have a catalyst lying on the base of a boiling tube here. It's normally in a lab, clay pot fragments and this will speed up the reaction. You have a delivery tube stemming from the boiling tube which goes under water in a trough of water and you have an inverted gas jar. Now what will happen is as the alkane breaks up into smaller alkenes, the alkenes such as ethene will be transported up this gas jar and they'll push the water down because they're less dense, they'll rise to the top and force the water down all the way down until all the water has been replaced or displaced by ethene gas or an alkene. There are a few things you need to know about this practical. Firstly, you must keep the paraffin or the alkane fuel and the catalyst hot. So you have to heat the paraffin a bit, then the pot a bit, then this a bit, then this a bit, because the catalyst only works when it's hot. So what happens is as the alkane evaporates or vaporizes and travels over the catalyst, here it will break or crack. So you can see that happen here as it breaks apart. Then the smaller molecules will travel down the delivery tube as so. Now some of these molecules will be smaller alkenes. This doesn't represent that. But for example, ethene, which will rise to the top and, and push down the water. Now one thing that's becoming very popular in exams is to test you on this. If you kill the heat to this experiment, you put yourself in a dangerous position. You see, the heat basically expands the gases inside the boiling tube and creates a pressure outwards. This pressure keeps the water from entering the tube. If you were to remove the heat, the gases inside would take up less space, they would contract, and that would create a suction, drawing in cold water. When the cold water basically makes contact with the very hot boiling tube, it will cause the boiling tube to shatter, and that would not be safe. So to keep this experiment safe, you must keep the boiling tube hot while you're removing it. That way the gases don't contract. Then you can kill the heat. So remember, keep the boiling tube hot when removing to avoid suck back of cold water. So let's have a look at the real test. Here you can see I've got my delivery tube, my boiling tube, my catalyst and my soaked alkane fuel. I'm heating the catalyst and the fuel together, alternating between them. So you can see the flames going over both. And you can see ethene gas is being collected here in the boiling tube. More and more as we keep going. So it's breaking up and forming smaller alkenes. Now here's the thing, we can test for alkenes with bromine water, which starts off brownie orange and then decolorizes. This proves that we've collected alkenes and not alkanes. Although it's quite possible some smaller alkanes have got there as well, but they would not have an effect on the bromine water, only alkenes. So that explains the process and purpose of cracking. So now let's look at how we make and dispose of synthetic polymers, commonly to you and me, known as plastics. Firstly, what is a polymer? A poly, remember poly means many, a polymer are long chain molecules made from repeated links called monomers. Remember mono means one. So from one link we make a long chain of many links, poly and mono. It requires pressure and a catalyst. Not all polymers are synthetic. Many natural polymers exist within living bodies, such as starch, proteins and DNA. These are all natural polymers. So here's an example of how it might work. Here we have glucose as the monomer, single glucose molecules, and here we have amino acids as a monomer, single amino acid molecules. So these are monomers, and what will happen is 
they will be stitched or bonded together to make polymers. So when glucose stitches together or bonds together, we make the polymer starch. Similarly, when amino acids bond together, we make the polymer, the natural polymer, protein. But natural polymers exist in living organisms. We don't require any special treatment to make them. Synthetic polymers we actually have to process to make. So here's the main example you get tested on. Here we have lots of ethene alkene, ethene monomers. And then we apply pressure and a catalyst, use of a catalyst, and that causes the double bond or the spare bond to break open so it can stitch itself or bond to other monomers. So we can see that many of them have joined together and there's no more double bonds. They've all snapped open and bonded with other ethene molecules. And this molecule, you can imagine, goes on and on and on. That's why I left an open-ended bond here. So chemically, it's really easy to remember because ethene, the monomer, becomes polyethene, many ethene molecules, and that's the polymer. Always write poly and then in brackets what the monomer was. One of the more challenging questions they can ask you is writing the chemical formula equation for this. It's nothing to stress about, but it can be a little bit fiddly to understand the difference between the two sides of the equation. Firstly, let's look at the monomer side. Here we have ethene. Here I've just drawn the hydrogen straight up, but you can draw them diagonally if you want. Now, I've put brackets around the ethene molecule and put an N, meaning we have X amount of um, ethene molecules for 10,000. doesn't matter. That's what this N represents, a random number. But on this side, notice the difference. Now we don't have that double bond. Here we did, but no longer because it's snapped open, so it's ready to bond with others. Notice now how the brackets actually go through the bond, which implies that this molecule extends beyond the confines of the brackets. And the N is the same as that. So let's say we had four ethenes here. Well, we can expect this repeat to happen four times. So what we're saying is this link has been repeated X number of times or N number of times. So here are four synthetic polymers you must know for your exams. You must know what they are and how we use them because of their specific properties. First is polyethene or polythene to you and me, which is elastic, it's light, and for that reason we can use it to make plastic bags and hose pipes which are flexible. Polypropene is a tough, flexible synthetic polymer or plastic, so we use it to make hardened plastic containers such as its bin and carpets as well because of its flexible nature and hard wearing nature. Next, and this is a bit of a mouthful, polychloroethene, also known as PVC, so just remember PVC, is flexible and water resistant. For that reason, we can use it to make clothing such as fake leather and also electrical cables. Be aware that polychloroethene or PVC is not a hydrocarbon unlike these and that's because it contains chlorine. Remember, hydrocarbons are molecules that contain hydrogen and carbon atoms only. Finally, and try saying this one, polytetrafluoroethene commonly known as Teflon by the people who branded it, is flame resistant and unreactive and also very durable. It's hard wearing, so it's perfect for making non-stick coating for frying pans. And if you're into cooking, you'll really appreciate what that's done for us. Now, I must admit, I get a bit depressed thinking about plastics and how much we use them. I think it's a real bad dependency. And I think anything we can do to reduce our dependency is really worth doing for the sake of our planet and future generations we must lower our dependency on crude oil. That's why many supermarkets offer a bag for life scheme and I recommend everyone does that. So why are plastics bad? Well, firstly, they're non-biodegradable. That means bacteria can't break them down in the soil, so they remain in landfill sites for years. We could try burning them, but the problem with burning them is they release toxic gases which are harmful for the environment. And recycling? Well, yes, of course we should recycle, but only some plastics can be recycled. For example, milk bottle plastics, they're fine, they can be recycled, but something like vacuum-packed plastics which package our food, they can't be recycled. However, scientists, being generally the good people that they are, are trying very hard to combat this problem, and they've come up with some pretty amazing solutions. Firstly, some plastic bags now contain starch granules, which are biodegradable. Remember, starch is a natural polymer. So the plastic bag is impregnated with long starch molecules and microbes can break these down so the polythene bag gets broken down to very, very small pieces. They're still there in the soil, but in much, much, much smaller pieces, presenting a lesser problem. Secondly, some plastics can actually be broken down by sunlight and the agricultural industry uses this technique quite commonly. So the effect of sunlight can again break them down to small pieces. And that's how you explain the problems linked to making synthetic polymers.